Welcome back to Metabolic Mind, a nonprofit initiative of Bazooki Group, where we focus on the intersection of metabolic health and mental health. Today, we're going to talk about mitochondria, all things mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, but it's so much more than that. So my guest is Dr. Martin Picard, who really is one of the worldwide experts on mitochondria. Now, now Dr. Picard um, has a PhD in mitochondrial biology from McGill University, and he's an associate professor of behavioral medicine in psychiatry and neurology at Columbia, where he runs the mitochondria psychobiology lab. And, you know, hearing Dr. Picard talk about mitochondria is really in inspiring. Like he cares so much about it and he's so passionate about it. And you can tell if you go to his Twitter profile, um, which is at mitopsychobio, his picture is a huge mitochondria drawn in the sand, which just shows like how, how passionate he is about mitochondria. And he talks about it so well. And we start with the basics because a lot of people really don't know what mitochondria are. You can't, you know, see them with your naked eye. You can't touch them. You know, you know, they're hard to sort of conceptualize. So we talk about what they are, how involved in our bodies they are, how they're in every cell and how they're involved in so many disease processes, but also how they're involved with health. So it's not just all about disease. It's also about promoting health and what can we do to improve mitochondrial function and mitochondrial health. So we go through this whole journey um, in this interview with Dr. Picard talking about mitochondria. So if you're wondering about mitochondria, you're wondering about their role in health, specifically mental health and mental illness, but really any any organ system disease process, mitochondria have a role. This is the podcast. Dr. Picard is the guy for you to listen to um, because he not only does he know it well and research it, but he's so good about communicating about mitochondria. So I hope you enjoy this interview about mitochondria as much as I did with Dr. Martin Picard. But before the interview, please remember our channels for informational purposes only. We're not providing individual group healthcare or medical advice. We're not providing a doctor-patient relationship. Any, you know, any things we discuss could be potentially harmful if done on your own without clinical supervision. So never change any of your medications or your lifestyle to treat a medical condition without consulting your healthcare provider first. All right, so let's get on with the interview with Dr. Martin Picard. Well, Dr. Picard, thank you so much for joining me on Metabolic Mind so we can really sort of dig into and better understand what are mitochondria. So thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, so I want to start with a little funny story. So um, I'm helping my son. This was a little while ago, a few months ago. I was helping my 10-year-old son prepare for this little science competition. And one of the things he had to learn about were all the different organelles in the cells. So we're looking at, you know, Golgi bodies and endoplasmic reticulum and, of course, mitochondria. And like any 10-year-old, he says, why do I have to learn this? This is so stupid. Like, I, these, I, these are so tiny little things. What are they? And I said, hold on. And I ran and I got Chris Palmer's book and I told him about mitochondria in the book and I told him about the work you're doing and, you know, his eyes glazed over and he didn't really care. But I felt good that I had some like concrete example to explain to him why he had to learn about mitochondria. Now, you study mitochondria, you research mitochondria, but I think a lot of people still don't really understand like what are mitochondria and why are they so important and why are you devoting your, you know, your research to mitochondria? So if we can take a step back, can you give us like the brief 101 about mitochondria? Sure, yes. Um, and thank you for sharing your story. We have a book at home called uh, Cell Biology for Babies. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and yeah. there's a page there on, on you know, mitochondria. And uh, I've started this early also with my son. <laughs> no, Great. Um, knows about mitochondria. Um, yeah, so mitochondria are this, this beautiful little part of, of our cells. Uh, they're called organelles, right? The same way that the body is made of different organs that do different things. You know, we have a brain, we have a liver, a heart, and, and each organ, you know, has a different role in sustaining function and health of the, of the whole body. So mitochondria is one of the organs of the cell. Um, and maybe the best analogy there is, you know, the brain and, and, uh, and the way that mitochondria are involved in transforming energy, but also in processing a lot of information. Uh, so historically, mitochondria have been known as the powerhouse of the cell. I think that's a misnomer. And, uh, you know, sure, they, they, they're central to, you know, transforming energy from the oxygen that we breathe in, the food that we eat, right? And the mitochondria, those two things, the oxygen we breathe, the food we, the, oh, sorry, the oxygen we breathe, the food we consume, they converge on in mitochondria. And that's where the, the magic happens, where you have you know, incredibly complex processes of like ripping off electrons and the electron transport chain for people who've heard about this. And then their mitochondria become charged. So there's an electric charge literally inside every one of the 
hundreds to thousands of mitochondria that populate our cells. So the mitochondria become charged like little batteries and they're, they actually behave and exist as a network. And something very similar to a social network inside every cell where you have mitochondria that can fuse together to form longer filaments or, you know, tubules of mitochondria. Longer mitochondria can undergo fission or fragment into smaller bits. They have a life cycle. Old mitochondria actually die out and then new mitochondria are born. So there's a beautiful cycle there. They, they exchange information the same way that we talk with each other with, you know, language and sound mitochondria have all of these different ways of talking to each other through chemicals and hormones and and uh, ions and, um, and and other other mechanisms so there's there's this social life of these small little you know bean to um, to tubule shaped organelles in, inside the cell so um, and there's a whole history about how they came to be and why they're you know at the origin of life that we can get into if, if that's of interest yeah, it's so interesting to think about them as having social interactions with other mitochondria and and that it's beyond them just sitting there producing energy, but at their core, production of energy is sort of the, the one of the main features and, and that's why they're known for that. And when we talk about, you know, disorders uh, in human health, whether it's um, whether it's mental illness or whether it's other disorders, we're, we're starting to see it as a um, disorder of energy production which can then be sort of boiled down to the mitochondria. So you said, you know, mitochondria take in oxygen and they take in the food and then they create energy. That's where the magic happens to, to create energy. Now, I think what, what, what also is a little confusing though, is this happens everywhere, right? Like it's in your muscles, it's in your liver, it's in your heart, it's in your brain. So are mitochondria really just everywhere in our body? Yes, they're, they're everywhere. There's only one cell type that, uh, you know, the body is made of a few hundred cell types. There is one cell type that does not have mitochondria, uh, which is the, the, the one cell type that <laughs> actually carries the oxygen, right, to, towards the – because the purpose of breathing is to bring in oxygen to your lungs, and then oxygen from your lungs diffuses into your blood, and then the blood circulates and touches literally every cell in the body, right? Um, and there's one cell type in, in that – is a reason why blood is red because of the red blood cells, right? Uh, the red blood cells, their, their, their life purpose is to carry oxygen towards, you know, their the destination, every other cell in the body, where mitochondria ultimately are the, the oxygen consumer. So red blood cells don't have mitochondria, probably because otherwise that would, you know, the, the mitochondria there would consume the oxygen that uh, they're actually meant to transport. But Otherwise, every cell in the body, every neuron, every glial cell in the brain, every beating heart cell, every liver cell, every skin cell have, you know, hundreds to thousands of mitochondria per cell. Uh, and the beautiful thing that we're just starting to uncover now is that mitochondria are not all created the same. And different cell types in the body actually have different types of mitochondria. So we, we think of those as mitotypes. Uh, the same way that there are different cell types or different mitochondria types. Um, so the, the brain mitochondria are actually quite different than the, the heart mitochondria, than the liver mitochondria. So there is this beautiful diversity um, of, of, of mitochondria and, and that makes us think of, of, the, of, of them as more of a, a family of, of related organelles and not just kind of a, a single thing that's uh, you know, passively transforming energy. There's there's a diversity of different types of mitochondria that actually talk to each other. So the mitochondria in, in your adrenal glands, for example, where cortisol is made, talk to mitochondria in the brain. And so there, it's uh, the organism you, you can see if if you think about this the, the organism as a um, as an ecosystem where you have cells and an energetic system that talk to each other. Mitochondria is a, is a key part of this and um, and if you look at this from a mitocentric <laughs> perspective, uh, you know, you, you can think of the whole um, um, ecosystem of mitochondria as an energy transformation system. Uh, and uh, mitochondria transform energy. They don't create, uh, you know, energy per se. They, they take the energy from the food and the oxygen. And then as they combine, they can extract energy from this. So they can transform chemical energy from the food and oxygen into electrical energy 
inside the, the in the membrane potential that's called and then take the membrane potential this other form of energy and then turn this into a different kind of energy like atp maybe some people have, have heard about and then that is what powers you know the beautiful diversity of of human function and human experiences and eventually consciousness and uh, it all comes down to this transformation of energy inside mitochondria yeah like how you said if you look at it from a mitocentric standpoint like coming from like the mito mitochondria as the center but I think that's a hard thing for a lot of people to do because you can't see mitochondria. You can't, you know, you don't get a blood test for mitochondria, right? You get a blood test for your hemoglobin levels and your your kidney function and your liver function, but you don't you don't measure mitochondria. So um, it's sort of like a leap for people to say, or for some people to understand how widespread mitochondrial function and dysfunction impact our health. But is it safe to say that they're kind of involved with, I mean, just about any health or or disease process at its core could be related to mitochondrial function? Yes, uh, certainly. We, we try to, you know, review this. Um, and I should, you know, take a step back and say, we think of mitochondria and, you know, that organelle as, as you know, a potential cause first a, a source and a source of health and 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 life but then a cause of potential diseases uh, th that's a scientific model right that's a hypothesis that we're you know invested in in rigorously testing and um so we need to you know do this carefully but the, what the evidence that's there if you go into pubmed or onto google and you look for <laughs> studies that have looked at some mitochondrial impairment mitochondria have many functions right so alterations in some mitochondrial function including energy transformation but also mitochondrial signaling and any disease you can think of there is likely a scientific study that has investigated and, and identified you know a connection and then the question is uh, are impairments in mitochondrial biology driving those diseases? And I think the answer is likely yes. Uh, and and why is that? Uh, I think it's likely because energy is such a central part of of what we are, and you know of who we are to to some extent. Um, so I think that's why you know mitochondria have been implicated in our you know there's growing interest in in understanding the connection between mitochondrial biology and and health and and different disorders is because energy is is central to to what we are and how, you know how we function and if we think about the brain if you want to convince yourself and make this real because you're right <laughs> we can't see mitochondria and we have the chance here you know to have cool microscopes and you can put living cells and make the mitochondria fluorescent and then you look down the eyepiece and you see them move and like fuse and so you you, you can see them if you have the right equipment but <laughs> our day-to-day -day experience is you know is is that of you know is a, our subjective experience and the kind of the, the reality of the body and, and how we feed it and so on we're not aware of our mitochondria which is probably for the for the better <laughs> but if you want to convince yourself that how central energy is, if you just you know block blood flow to the brain, right? If you if you occlude the blood going to you you know perfusing your brain for just a few seconds, you're out. <laughs> consciousness is gone, right? And the reason consciousness disappears if you if you don't have blood flow to your to your brain or if your heart stops is because you're not feeding your mitochondria anymore. Right? You're not bringing them oxygen. You're not bringing them food substrates, and that you know shuts down everything. Uh, so that's I think a very real example of uh, you know how energy just sustains you know human life and and, and human consciousness. Uh, so anything we do, as as you know, you've uh, discussed uh, you know with many scientists and clinicians. Uh, the way we feed our body is the, the, the kind of energy we put into the system can actually influence, right? How the system works, uh, the brain and, and the whole organism. Yeah. So let's talk about that for a second, because, you know, one of the things we focus on at metabolic mind is the connection between metabolic and mental health. So when there's metabolic dysfunction that can impact, um, mental health and contribute to mental illness. And at its core, presumably, mitochondria are involved in, in that. So how does metabolic dysfunction and insulin resistance and, you know, what some things that are so prevalent in today's society, how does that impact mitochondria? So, yeah, metabolic dysfunction I, is an, an umbrella term, right, for 
that in, in my view re- reflects um, impaired energy flow, right? So uh, the, what sustains life is the, you know, blood flow that, you know, the beating heart is like a clear sign of life because by moving blood, you move energy, you move oxygen, you move, uh, you know, ketone bodies and fatty acids and, and glucose and proteins and so on. So, and these are energy forms. Uh, so the disorders of, of energy or metabolic dysfunction can be reflected in insulin resistance as which is reflected in or which represents the inability of, you know, cells to take in food substrates when that's needed. Um, so there can be metabolic dysfunction at the whole organism level, right? Which can, um, you know, cause or materialize in, in obesity, for example, then there's kind of a systems level uh, metabolic dysfunction. Insulin resistance would be a feature of this. At the cellular level, there can be, you know, metabolic dysfunction there. And then if we go inside the cell, there can be mitochondrial uh, energy transformation defects or, you know, impairments, which of course ripples out. If the mitochondria are not functioning properly, that can impair how cells function, how the tissue function, and how the whole organism functions. Uh, so mitochondria are kind of a, 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 such a metabolic hub that their 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 um, inability to transform energy properly or misregulation of you know mitochondria getting turned on and making a lot of ATP or you know being dialed down and making less ATP can really uh, affect other levels of of biological and physiological complexity. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I, I think it's clear there are a lot of things that can impact uh, mitochondrial function. And But when it comes to mental illness and psychiatric conditions in general, there's been a lot of talk about genetic predispositions. So are there genetic predispositions to mitochondrial dysfunction as well as environmental factors of just how we live our life that impact it? But what do, what do the genetics say about it? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so yes, and I'm not a clinician, but I spend half a day a week in the clinic with my close colleague, neurologist, uh, Michio Hirano, uh, where I see patients who have uh, rare genetic mitochondrial disorders. So um some people may know mitochondria, you know, those small living life forms inside every cell, they have their own DNA. And that's, you know, related to their, um, uh, to their past life as bacteria and, you know, when they were incorporated. So they have a circular little piece of DNA like bacteria, um, which have a few genes that are involved in energy transformation. And some people are born uh, with a defect, a mutation or a uh, they lose a chunk of mitochondrial DNA, a portion of, of the, the mitochondrial DNA sequence. So those are called mitochondrial DNA deletions. Uh, and that causes primary genetic mitochondrial diseases. Um, so they're, they're, uh, these are rare, uh, you know, genetic conditions. And uh, but I think they're incredibly illustrative of what impaired mitochondrial biology can can do to the whole body and and to to the whole mind and uh, there these people suffer from multi system disease right so often they have uh, cardiac involvement digestive issues renal issues and uh, endocrine issues immune uh, alterations in, in some ways and many of them uh, have you know cognitive and and psychiatric manifestations uh, so there's a there's a lot of uh, comorbidity between primary, you know, mitochondrial diseases that have historically been the domain of neurology and and psychiatric conditions. And I, this is an area that, you know, we're interested to understand more, but that uh, has been, you know, understudied. So I think that's one of the good evidence that if something's wrong with the mitochondria, and here we have the kind of a primary genetic defect in mitochondria, this leads to uh, impaired brain function and, and psychiatric um, conditions. Yeah, that is that is very clear evidence about that connection. But then, as I alluded to, it certainly doesn't have to be a genetic reason. There are unfortunately plenty of lifestyle things we can do to ourselves to to uh, decrease our mitochondrial function and decrease our mitochondrial health. And the big ones that seem to get a lot of attention are, of course, nutrition and then sort of poor sleep and toxins. And so, I mean, how do you see? the the main um, the main detractors from mitochondrial health that unfortunately we do in our society. 
Mm -hmm. Yes. So you're pointing to what I just described were uh, inherited, you know, mitochondrial disorders, and then they're acquired mitochondrial disorders. So all of the acquired, you know, result from our exposures and, you know, kind of internal exposures. <laughs> we're studying how psychological states and cr exposure to chronic stress or early life adversity and or the uh, kind of the, dis the disorders that <laughs> we can create ourselves either psychologically or through, you know, nutrition and, and other things. Uh, and how they can influence mitochondria. So this is all part of the acquired, you know, mitochondrial um, impairments or dysfunctions. Um, so there's a number of things there that converge on on mitochondria, including diet, which is a, a very big one. Everything we put in our mouth ultimately converges either directly on mitochondria or you know around the the metabolic pathways that mitochondria are involved in regulating. Uh, so that's, you know, a very big one. Uh, there's a lot of good research on, uh, you know, insecticides and pesticides. And uh, some of those that were used, you know, back in the days were we use in the laboratory as poisons for mitochondria. If you want to know, uh, you know, how a mitochondrial impairment will change uh, gene expression, right? Some genes that are turned on or turned off in a cell. You can do experiments in this where you have living human cells with their mitochondria, which you can image. And then you can perturb mitochondria, right, experimentally. And then you ask, ooh, what does that do to the signals that the cell will secrete or to the, the process of cell division or the, the, the effect on a stem cell or things like that? And some of the tools we use there or former, <laughs> formerly used, you know, poisons or in insecticides um, that, that are direct, you know, poisons to, to mitochondria. So uh, there are many things that, you know, um, that we've used or you know that are around our ecosystems um that can you know ad adversely affect mitochondrial biology yeah that's really disturbing that you don't have to come up with some specialized mitochondrial poison it can just be something that's a run-of-the-mill pesticides that's been used before and and that's a a potent mitochondrial toxin it's a little little disturbing um it but i i like how you also mentioned about you know psychological states and how that can affect your mitochondria. And, and so how does our psychological state influence our bodies? That's like a big question that you're researching. And, and, you know, the, the whole brain body connection kind of goes both ways, right? The, um, it, uh, dysfunction in the body can affect the brain. And I don't know if you want to call it dysfunction in the brain or, but, but brain experiences, psychological experiences can, can affect the body. And it seems like mitochondria are the, are the connector there. I mean, that's the common variable. Is that right? Yes. You know, every, so the, the brain is part of the body and let's remind ourselves, right. <laughs> uh, but it's, there's, there's, uh, many reasons why we think of, you know, brain and body. And I think it's useful to think of, you know, brain, body or mind, body processes, right. That drive the human experience. And, uh, you know, as you know, there is good evidence, for example, that the gut microbiome sends, uh, signals to the brain. And then that I actually influence mood and affect and, you know, might contribute to, um, to some, you know, to, to mental health. Uh, so there's, there's clear kind of, uh, body to brain signals, right? And the, the brain can experience and, and uh, respond to the metabolic state of the body. And then there are, of course, uh, very important uh, drivers, you know, top down brain body uh, signals where the brain actually regulates uh, blood glucose, for example. And, you know, you can, psychological stress will, can trigger hyperglycemia, especially in, in susceptible individuals, right? So you, you, you see a stressful email or, you know, you have a, a stressful, you know, interaction and then you secrete cortisol that come from the adrenal glands uh, and then cortisol goes and then to the liver and s says, uh, release glucose in, into the blood and then we'll go to the muscle, the, the cortisol go to the muscle and causes insulin resistance. So then that drives hyperglycemia. So uh, a simple psychological state can drive uh, a change in in peripheral you know glucose level so um, so there's metabolic influence on the brain and the brain can influence uh, systemic energy metabolism but every little process we think of when we think of like brain body interactions um, a stressful thought will accelerate a heart rate within seconds right well the heart beating faster costs energy right every time the heart beats 
there's energy consumed that need to come from mitochondria. And if you're, if you're having an experience, this changes gene expression, you know, inside a cell or you create a, is, uh, produce or release a hormone while well, turning on a gene, right? Turning DNA into RNA costs energy. Then taking the RNA, making a protein costs energy. And then taking that protein, that hormone, let's say, and then folding it and then packaging it and then releasing it, all of this costs energy. So um, every little bit of communication between and the body is energetically demanding and is, is an energetic uh, process, you know, by nature. So I, I think, you know, we think that's why uh, energetic processes and then mitochondrial biology being a, a central part of this is is a, a, an important driver or if you want the, the fabric right of brain body connection is an energetic uh, the brain body connection is an energetic connection and and therefore energetic perturbations in the mitochondria can you know likely uh, you know uh, perturb that system yeah, it is fascinating how the the two way street between the brain and the body is is constant, and there's such a such an impact both ways that we need to be aware of in so many variables. Um, but now to, to to bring it back to psychiatry and and to symptoms of whether it's bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, major depression, um, what about medications? Because you know if that is a if those diseases have a mitochondrial basis and then medications are used to treat them, can medications also further mitochondrial dysfunction or are there some that can improve mitochondrial function? What, what have you learned from a medication standpoint? Yeah, there's, uh, there's recent interest in, in this. And so people have studied this um, in, in fairly rigorous studies in vitro with cultured human cells or in, in vivo in animals. And so you can give cells or animals different, you know, classes of, um, of uh, psychotropic medication and ask, does this change the ability of mitochondria to, you know, transport the electrons, to charge the membrane, to make ATP, so different domains of mitochondrial biology? And the answer yeah, is yes, certainly. Uh, there's uh, specific classes of, of, of medication um, that impair mitochondrial energy transformation pretty significantly. Uh, which is not widely known, and certainly uh, <laughs> uh, psychiatrists don't learn about this. And and it's, there is so it's it's not you know well well known. But in the last you know ten years, there's been quite a bit of research on this. As we uncover, you know, are starting to understand the role of mitochondria, the role of energetic processes in neurotransmitter release, neurotransmitter reuptake, and uh, you know neuronal firing and neuron to glial cell communication, all of these processes are energetic in nature. So as this becomes better understood and the connection with, with uh, mental health and psychiatric conditions is, is better understood, there's been a rising interest to connect you know, those treatments, like you're saying, to, to mitochondrial biology, and, and there's a clear connection there. And that's not my area. I don't know the details, um, but there's, there's certainly some you know, classes of medication that have a direct effect on on the core machinery for energy transformation, which is a little scary because um, you know playing with the chemistry without really understanding how this chemistry gives rise to human experiences and 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 to mental health is is a little dicey. And I think that's you know, there's a lot of medications in, in psychiatry. You know, lithium being an example, we don't know how lithium works. <laughs> Uh, we have no idea, you know, the, uh, the underlying biology, but there's a clear effect of lithium on mitochondrial biology. And uh, so th there's some people, you know, believe that um, uh, parts of, of, you know, the, of, our, you, of the human experience and um, the function of brain circuitry and brain networks is actually driven by mitochondrial biology. Um, so the, maybe the, the reason lithium works in some cases is because of its effect on mitochondria. Mitochondria could be the target for lithium, I think, based on the evidence out there, that's, that's a, a, a possibility. Mm. Yeah, I think it's so interesting, though, the way you, 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 you describe that there are certain medication subclasses that, that are going to impact mitochondrial function. And, you know, we're going to learn a lot more about this, I think, as research focuses on it. But does that you know, separate medications into maybe short-term beneficial medications, but long-term harmful medications. Like maybe they're doing something in the short term, but over the long term, if they're degrading mitochondrial function, then they're going to lose their effectiveness. And maybe that's why a number of psychiatric medications, you know, 
worsen cardiometabolic health? Uh, could mitochondria be a reason for that? I mean, certainly, certainly plausible. Yeah, and there's you know you mentioned acutely versus chronically. Uh, you know that we have a hard time. I think uh, <laughs> as uh, the way humans think, and maybe the way you know scientists are forced to do their, their research. Uh, it's it's hard to keep those two things in mind. That what you observe, you know, acutely, you, does that translate chronically? And there is a, there's a lot of of stimuli and um, stressors that have a certain effect acutely, but chronically the effect is quite different. And uh, a lot of you know medications, uh, I think sometimes have an acute, you know, acutely, you know, can can help. And maybe that's where psychiatry is most useful in terms of, you know, helping people deal with you know, life-threatening, uh, you know, acute episodes of psychosis, for example, but then chronically we're, we're really bad at, at helping people and, and maybe, but all most, from what I know of, of, you know, standard, uh, of, um, um, the way we apply pharmacology to treat people with, you know, severe mental illness, those medications are, are given without, you know, the idea that this should be short term. And, and most of the time, I think it's, it's given and, and patients are, are, are told or kind of uh, led to believe that they need to continue taking that medication forever. Um, so, but we have no idea. I think that there's no data on humans on the long term effects of, of medications on, on mitochondrial health and mitochondrial biology, which, which is a little scary to think about. Yeah, so I, you mentioned you know this long term use of medications and with without thinking maybe they should be short term, but also without thinking what else can be done to specifically target mitochondrial health because maybe if we're using medications and we're doing other things to target mitochondrial function and you know overall brain health, then we can start to potentially taper those medications under professional guidance, of course, because everything else is improving. Because we have heard from a number of people that they're treated, they get over their acute episode, but then they just feel like they can't thrive. They can't get back to their life. And it's not until they do other interventions that Im that allow them to get back to their lives, which frequently can also then coincide with tapering of medications, which of course is a very complicated topic. And we have a whole video with um, Dr. Georgia Ede and Matt Bazuki about that. But so what it brings us back to though, is this question to you is what can we do to improve our mitochondrial function? And I know you're not a, you know, you're not a doctor, you're not giving medical advice here. You're just talking about you as a, a someone who knows mitochondria better than anybody. You know, what can we do to improve our mitochondrial function, which then could potentially be seen as a, adjunctive interventions to medications in certain disease states? Yes. So you make such a good point, Brett. The the ability to thrive, right? And to exhibit resilience and robustness. Like life is made of challenges. And I think what we do really well as living organisms, <laughs> not just humans, but all living organisms, is we take a we take a challenge, right? And then we bounce through it. And um, and there there are some things then, you know, that make us unable to to bounce. And and I think that's one way in which I think about you know, acute uh, psychiatric episodes where, you know, you go really deep and then it's hard to, you know, to come out of it. And, and sometimes I worry that some of the medication actually promotes this stuckness, right? And, and, and prevents, you know, the, this rebound. Um, and if we think about kind of going down and then rebounding and this, this thriving uh, ability, this requires energy. Right? Like it requires fundamentally a change in, in how the brain operates, the brain body system functions and your ability to make meaningful life changes or right changes in, in, in your social circle or like all of this requires energy. And I think that's why change just as a general thing in life <laughs> changes are, you know, are challenging to most people and because change requires energy. Uh, it's like coming out of inertia. If you want to stop something that's moving, right? If you, you, like, so fundamentally, there's like an energetic energetic requirement to to change, and and then therefore bouncing back is an energetic process. So impairing mitochondria in that situation, or if you live with impaired mitochondria, I think this can be even more difficult. So that being said, what can we do to promote you know good or to optimize mitochondrial health? Uh, energy transformation or, you know, proper mitochondrial signaling. Uh, there's not a lot of, 
um, there's a need for more research on this. That's the you know, first thing I want to say. Um, there are three things that we know can optimize and improve, you know, mitochondrial energy transformation capacity based on kind of scattered research over the last maybe two decades. One thing we know for sure is moving, uh, being physically active, right? So I think many people know, you know, exercise is uh, a protective factor against, you know, m- many, uh, you know, mental illnesses. Um, and uh, exercise is a protective factor for pretty much every disease that we know of. And if we flip this, if we think about health, right, as not just the absence of exercise, but this ability to thrive and, and to, um, and, and to, you know, live a long, healthy life, uh, exercise is good for this. So moving stimulates and pretty much inside every uh, organ that people have looked at uh, stimulates the production of more mitochondria. So if you move, the body feels, oh, I need more energy. How, how do I handle this? Let me make more mitochondria. That's called mitochondrial biogenesis. Um, and we know that this, this happens, you know, a lot, for example, in muscles. Uh, if you go from being completely sedentary uh, to training for a marathon, you can double the number of mitochondria in your muscles. Uh, so there's quite a bit of plasticity there. And, and, and we've done some studies in uh, animal studies of chronic stress, for example. And this changes how many mitochondria, how much mitochondria are in different brain regions. Uh, so moving is number one thing we can do to increase a number or maybe the quality of the mitochondria. Number two is not eating too much. So being hungry once in a while is healthy. <laughs> and we evolved, you know, to do this. And the reason why being hungry is, is not eating too much is, is healthy is not too clear. Maybe it's because it puts you into ketosis. Uh, maybe it because, it's because it prevents nutritional or metabolic oversupply or, you know, overload. People have done beautiful studies in, in cultured cells where you take cells and then you bombard them with sugar and with fat. And so that causes kind of – there's too much energy supply relative to what the cells need. And this causes, within minutes, the fragmentation of mitochondria. So you go from having a beautiful network of connected and you know dynamic uh, mitochondria talking to each other to a completely fragmented mitochondrial network. So – there's mitochondrial fragmentation that arises uh, you know, very fairly quickly in cultured cells like this uh, in response to this metabolic overload, oversupply. Uh, so if you eat too much and uh, most people are able to you know, take the excess glucose, excess you know, fat and, and excess nutrients in the blood and then store this in, in subcutaneous adipose tissue, right? And then we call this obesity or uh, um, you know, just, yeah, adiposity. Um, but the, the, the reason this exists physiologically is because having too much energy substrate, too much sugar, fats, or proteins in your blood is, is actually damaging. It's damaging to the mitochondria. So not eating too much and, you know, maybe, um, something like intermittent fasting or just having just a good diet where you're hungry once in a while and then you have a good meal and then you're hungry and then you have a good meal. And, you know, every ancient tradition um, uh, has kind of a fasting period built into their, their, their culture, right? And that's probably for a reason because once in a while, uh, you know, being hungry actually stimulates uh, some cellular processes, probably mitochondria, in a way that is, you know, helpful and, and health promoting. So the magic question with fasting, though, is how long? And I know it's like impossible to answer with with certainty, but, you know, time-restricted eating, it can help reduce calories. Maybe, you know, it can help reduce insulin and improve um, insulin sensitivity to some degree. You know, probably like a minimum of 12 hours, maybe has to be 16, maybe has to be 18. Do you have any sense when it comes to mitochondria where the sweet spot is, or it's just clear that some amount of it helps and we still need to learn more about the specifics? Yeah, I think it's it's clear that some amount of it helps. I don't know that we have the right evidence to be prescriptive here about how long should you fast, and it probably depends. If if you're on a ketogenic diet, right, and and you or you have a you're on a low carb diet, maybe you don't need to fast for as long to to you know derive the benefits than if you're on a a regular you know a high carb diet, and maybe you know each person's metabolism is is pretty different. 
And it's clear that some people respond a lot better to, uh, you know, nutritional ketosis than some others. And uh, so the, the benefits are individual specific. And I think uh, in the same way that each person responds differently to exercise, there, there are some people for whom exercise is, is, doesn't seem to trigger a lot of health benefits. And, and it just makes them, it puts them into a bad place if, if you do too much of it. Um, but other people just respond amazingly <laughs> well to it, to exercise and it's, you know, life transforming. So I think there are individual differences that are poorly understood. And most of the studies we do are based on like group differences. You do an RCT and then you look for a mean difference and like 50 people here, 50 people here. Oh, like exercise was good or, you know, keto diet was good. But there are always people that are at the bottom of, you know, the respond low responders and high responders. Um, so I think the way we do our science, the way we kind of approach things is a little narrow sighted, doesn't, doesn't, um, uh, you know, respect the, the, the degree of individual differences or individuality. So I, I have a hard time. And I think ultimately we need to move towards a more, uh, individualized way of doing medicine, uh, and, and, you know, of, of promoting health. So I, I don't know that there's going to be one kind of solution for, for, for everyone. I think that's a great point about the, the translation of the research to the, the one individual or the one, you know, if you being your own person and, and how does that relate? And you have to start somewhere. You have to use the evidence you have, but it's not the end all and be all because there are the individual variations. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right. So we went through moving your body. We went through don't eat too much. And then we got number three. So what's number three on mitochondrial health list? So number three is the most speculative. And we have some, you know, evidence that how you feel, and and I'll focus specifically on positive psychological states, might actually drive changes in your mitochondria. And um, and we did a study a few years ago with Elissa Eppel, uh, UCSF, where they uh, took about 90 women who, um, who were asked every morning and every evening how they feel. And then, you know, you imagine you wake up in the morning and then you're asked, how do you feel now, right? Do you feel you know, inspired or do you feel, uh, you know, confident about your day uh, or do you feel worried and you don't know what's going to happen today and that's really stressful to you. And then in the evening, there was kind of a more elaborate uh, questionnaire that asked how much of this did you feel today? And then there were kind of items like love, closeness and trust and, uh, you know, being inspired and motivated and uplifted and, you know, connected to others and so on. And then some negative things like feeling betrayed and, uh, you know, rejected and feeling sad and depressed and, um, and I think everyone, you know, can can imagine some days you feel a lot of positive stuff, right? Like you had a, a great day with your partner, or with your colleagues at work, or so you felt a lot of positive things and not so much negative things. And some other days you feel a lot of negative things <laughs> because of things that happened, because of your, you know, psychobiological state, you know, whatever this, whatever drives the emergence of those positive negative experiences. So they ask those questions. So we have kind of reports on how women feel for seven days in a row for a whole week, which is beautiful, you know, uh, daily repeated measures of, of someone. And then we, uh, we were able to have white blood cells, immune cells from these women on measured on the Wednesday. So they answered these questions from, you know, this, the, the Sunday to the Saturday for these seven days. And then on a Wednesday, they came to the clinic, gave blood. Then uh, Elissa's team isolated white blood cells. And then we assayed the mitochondria. And then what we measured in the mitochondria there is we call the mitochondrial health index, which is basically how much energy can each mitochondrion transform, right? So that's kind of a proxy for a simplistic proxy for mitochondrial health. So we were able to, to relate for the first time how people felt, right, across that week and, and their mitochondria in the middle of that week. Um, and so we asked, you know, a, a simple question uh, first do people who feel more positive have better mitochondrial health than people who feel more experience more negative things? Right. Uh, and, and the answer to this was, you know, yes. And it seems like people who experience more positive things have slightly better mitochondrial health. Uh, but then the more interesting question was, well, we know how uh, these women reported feeling for the three days before we took the mitochondria. And then for the three days after we took the mitochondria. So we can ask, is it how people feel that predicts, right? Or drives the mitochondrial health? Or is it the mitochondrial health that drives and predicts how people feel, right? Um, and the 
what the study showed is that how people felt uh, in the morning and the evening uh, on the three days before, on the Monday, the Tuesday, the Wednesday, actually predicted mitochondrial health, uh, but not the other way around. So those are mitochondria in the immune cells, right? And remember what we talked about earlier, mitochondria are different. The brain mitochondria are different than the heart mitochondria and the immune mitochondria are also different. So it seems like uh, how we feel might drive uh, a fair, uh, a fairly large change in, in the biology of the mitochondria and the, the energy production capacity of our immune uh, mitochondria. And uh, so if that's true, we need to replicate this and we're in the process of developing a study to do this, you know, at scale and over longer periods and with repeated measures of mitochondria and, and so on. Um, so if that's true, right, that, that Im implies that feeling more positive, um, uh, having more positive experiences can actually directly influence the mitochondrial biology. And, and if you can improve the mitochondrial biology and the, the ability of mitochondria to transform energy, in the immune cells, well, maybe that happens also in your brain cells. And, and we have evidence that this is the case. And Caroline Trump, uh, who, who works in our group, uh, has amazing data in brain mitochondria. So she was able to measure gene expression in the brain of individuals who have uh, who've passed away, but in whom the, uh, our colleagues had collected um, data on how socially connected they feel, their level of well-being or their level of depression and, and isolation before they died, right? So you have uh, the, the psychological exposures or the psychological state of these people before they die, and then you have the brain after they died. Uh, and then Caroline used some fancy single cell uh, gene expression analysis and neurons and astrocytes and microglia to ask, is there a connection? Between how people, you know, they said, I'm feeling great. I have amazing sense of purpose. You know, I feel like my life is meaningful. I have great friends and so on. Well, does this person have better functioning mitochondria in their neurons or in their glial cells than someone who says, I wake up in the morning. I don't really want to be here. And, and, I, and, and I, I don't feel well. And I, I'm fairly depressed. And what she's finding is, yes. And uh, the mitochondria are different in people who, who report more positive experiences uh, than people who, who don't. Uh, so this is opening up a, a new layer of biology that, you know, there's a, a, a direct psychobiological connection between the lived human experience and the biology of our mitochondria. So then I, if we speculate a little bit, it, it could be that, you know, choosing to do something that you find meaningful and purposeful, right? And arranging your life in, in, you know, as much as possible in a way that, that you feel good about it, right? And, and making decisions in terms of what you eat, in terms of the, the people that you surround yourself with, in terms of the job you, you choose, um, actually makes a difference on your biology and on the biology of your mitochondria. You know, this would be amazing. And I think that would be consistent with kind of the, the growing understanding of the, the metabolic nature of, of uh, and functioning of, of the brain and, and mental health and maybe a path to, to mental health is <laughs> to taking care of your mitochondria and you can take care of your mitochondria by by moving more by being hungry once in a while and by you know making choices that make you feel inspired and, and, and motivated about life. That's so, yeah, I think that's so interesting. And you can tell your, your excitement and your passion just in the way you're, you're explaining it, which I think is wonderful. But you can look at these studies that show people who are more positive and had a better, better outlook on life, that they, they live longer, they have fewer health problems. And I would always sort of take those with a grain of salt, like, okay, but there's so many confounding variables and it's just an association. And, you know, it's just that they, they make better choices in life and, and are, are healthier in other ways. But now you're saying, well, maybe it actually is causative and there's a mechanism for that causation, which is opening up this whole new sort of realm, um, which I think is really exciting. And, and so, yeah, just, just be happy and we'll be, <laughs> and you'll help your mitochondria, but there, there's more to it. So I think that's really exciting. And, and, you know, this is, uh, this is a hypothesis, right? And, but there's a number of, of converging lines of evidence that uh, what we experience actually translates directly into, you know, real molecular changes, energetic changes in our mitochondria. So there's a need now for more research to understand, you know, the mechanisms there and whether those links are direct or maybe, you know, you feel great, therefore you sleep better. And it's actually the sleep that making your mitochondrial health, you know, improved. 
or you know you 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 feel good and therefore you eat you know well and so there's all of these confounders either we see them as confounders or we see them as kind of this network this ecosystem of of you know um of behaviors and you know lifestyle and and you know nutrition and biology and psychological state it's it's all interconnected um so there but i think the the emerging science is you know makes me optimistic that we can uncover and identify you know real connections there that it actually end up being empowering right that yeah, it's, empowering i like that yeah that's yeah, it, an important part a lot of how we do medicine now and the the public message around genetic predispositions which i think is has been overhyped because for for many reasons we could talk about if you want uh, this is highly disempowering and and i think is is not justified you know scientifically based on the, the evidence uh, i think the the alternative framework that is i think a bigger container that respects more kind of the the reality of individualities and um, kind of idiosyncratic differences and and how people manifest health and how people manifest you know their their um, the expression of their mental illness and, you know each person is different and we have these diagnostic categories but each individual person is different people like we said earlier respond to therapies you know differently and um, and I think that's is more consistent not with a fixed genetic predisposition but you know, health is dynamic, and for the most part, genetic is is fixed, right? If 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 everything was caused by genes, and there would be kind of a, this chronic trajectory of <laughs> you would have no no room to be healthy and then be sick and then be healthy again. What we know is that mental health and, and physical health is highly dynamic. So, just just like energetic processes in the body, energetic processes are dynamic, and I think there's there's a lot more uh, evidence to think that. Uh, the basis of health, you know, once you have the structure and you have kind of the basic information laid down in the genome, the, the basis of, of how health manifests over time is energetic in nature. And we've lacked tools. I think the reason we've been so focused on other things and genes is, is we've lacked tools to measure energy and we can see it. Like you can, you can visualize a genome, you can measure sequence of letters and the DNA, and then you can say, ah, now I know something about this person. Energy is much more difficult to to measure, and I think by focusing on mitochondria, it's giving us a an in or at least you know a tractable scientific model that, that we can you know explore the underlying basis for for human health and, and human disease. So this makes me extremely optimistic about uh, our ability to you know build a framework that will be empowering for 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 people and that can be transformative. Yeah, I think that's a that's such a great way to wrap it up on that note. And, and you know, we really it's been a wonderful discussion going through just what mitochondria are, their role in energy, their role in, in disease processes, and their role in health and empowering the things we can do to improve mitochondrial function. So this has been a, a wonderful discussion, and I really appreciate you taking the time. So if, I, there's so much more to learn, though, especially from you and all the research and the work that you're doing. So if people wanted to find out more about what you're doing, where can we direct them to go? Yes, thank you. Yeah, there's, no, there's a number, a growing number uh, of research groups worldwide who are interested in mitochondria and mitochondrial psychobiology. Uh, so this makes me you know, hopeful that you know, together as a, as a community, we'll, you know, we'll make progress at, at a, a rate that will allow us to accelerate this transition towards sustainable health care, <laughs> not disease care, but health care. Uh, so people can go on our websites for, you know, our, our uh, papers. That's uh, Mitochondrial Psychobiology Lab at, at Columbia University. Uh, and on, on Twitter, there, uh, when we publish new articles, you know, we, we, we share them there and, and uh, are you know, I'd be excited to continue interacting with the, the community of people who are interested in knowing more and understanding the energetic basis of, of health. Great. Well, we'll link to those in the description so everybody can find them. And, and thank you again. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you, Brett.